Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Webster, and I'm chairing this evening's uh, July lecture. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay respect to elders, both past and present, of the Kulin Nation, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. Our July lecturer this evening is Dr. Michaela Trenti. Kayla has a very broad range of uh, research interests, and you're going to hear a little of that this evening. However, his major focus is the study of galaxies at extremely high redshifts. And for, that, for those studies, he's been awarded, I think, perhaps more, or more Hubble Space Telescope time in the last few years than anybody else, hundreds and hundreds of orbits. Um, Michaela completed his PhD in Italy in 2005 and then held some very prestigious postdoctoral positions at Cambridge, Boulder in the US and the Space Telescope Science Institute um, in Baltimore before he moved to a faculty position here in Melbourne in 2015. This is his, his inaugural July lecture and I hope you'll be hearing more from him over, over the coming uh, decades, mm -hmm. um, if we can keep you that long. But this evening he's going to talk to you about a, a, an extraordinary new project uh, that he's leading at the University of Melbourne, and I hope you will all go away very excited. So thank you, Michaela. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to discuss uh, uh, tonight uh, astrophysics with uh, uh, nanosatellites, in particular focusing on what uh, the recent technological advancements in miniaturization can uh, help us uh, to uh, carry out new astronomical observations from space at a fraction of the cost that traditional space missions uh, typically have. So tonight I will embark with you on a journey toward the design and hopefully followed by the launch of a small Melbourne-led space telescope which we called Skyhopper. And here in this artist impression, I have at the center a CAD model of our current design for the space telescope orbiting Earth above Australia. And depicted on the top, we have a representation of the science themes that the Skyhopper Space Telescope will contribute to. And in particular, the discovery of extrasolar planets orbiting around low mass stars in our solar neighborhood and potentially being capable of harboring uh, liquid water on their surfaces, uh, going all the way then to the edge of the observable universe, spotting gamma ray bursts in the near uh, infrared, uh, which are uh, gamma ray bursts as the universe's most powerful explosions after the Big Bang associated to the death of massive stars. And to, uh, throughout tonight, uh, we'll go and discuss a little bit the science uh, and the engineering of the Skyhopper uh, project. So our plan is for uh, uh, the lecture is divided into three main parts. First, this being a July lecture, we'll start by discussing the physics of uh, astronomical observations uh, from space. Why are we doing them? What we can learn from space that is not possible from uh, observatories uh, on the surface uh, of our uh, planet. And in particular, we'll see not only what we have uh, learned so far, but what are the key open questions that astronomers are trying to address in the next decade. And then we'll move to uh, the technology part to see how recent advancement in the technological innovation and in particular associated to miniaturization of uh, uh, spacecrafts and the CubeSats uh, can help us address this uh, astronomical uh, uh, scientific investigation. Finally, we'll put uh, uh, the science and the technology together to combine them and see how we arrived at the design of the Skyhopper Space Telescope. We'll go through its uh, characteristics, science uh, uh, impact, and uh, timeline. So let's start from the first 
uh, question. Why are astronomers uh, using space telescopes, doing astrophysics from space? After all, bringing uh, a telescope to space, designing it uh, to survive uh, the launch, operate without the uh, opportunities or with very little opportunities for servicing it, fixing it, upgrading it, is extremely uh, challenging and comes at a considerable uh, cost. Yet, uh, by being uh, uh, in space, we have a clear advantage over ground observatories. Uh, and this uh, advantage is, is illustrated here. We have an image of the Hubble Space Telescope, possibly the most iconic amongst the various space telescopes that astronomers have uh, at their disposal. That is being taken here uh, uh, in, uh, during the last uh, servicing mission when the space uh, shuttle uh, uh, docked with uh, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, uh, carried out some repairs and uh, uh, upgrades in uh, uh, 2009. Uh, and here we see Hubble happily above uh, Earth's uh, uh, atmosphere. And that's the key advantage that space telescopes have. They receive the light from uh, uh, astronomical sources uh, without uh, the, the photons having to go through Earth's atmosphere. And that is what uh, is uh, at the base of the great scientific discoveries uh, that received considerable uh, um, uh, um, <coughs> news uh, uh, coverage uh, uh, for a facility such as Hubble, which after all is only a modest uh, telescope uh, if we look at the light collecting power, 2.4 meter diameter compared to current telescopes on the ground that have much larger sizes and mirrors uh, up to 10 meters in uh, uh, diameter. So what is the effect of the atmosphere on uh, our astronomical uh, observations and why is the Hubble telescope uh, and other space telescopes outperforming their ground-based counterparts? So we have three main effects uh, uh, to take into consideration. First uh, is opacity, or the fact that there is only a limited uh, wi uh, window uh, you know, within uh, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum that ha in which the atmosphere has a clear transmission. And the concept is, is illustrated here in this view graph. We have as a function of uh, wavelength of our radiation going from very high energy uh, photons uh, shorter wavelengths, a fraction of a nanometer on the uh, left-hand side to very long, uh, low-energy photons on the right-hand side, the view graphs, and then the solid red line shows the opacity of our atmosphere. So we have 0% opacity means that the radiation can uh, travel through the atmosphere completely unimpeded. 100% opacity means that essentially all the radiation gets uh, uh, absorbed. We can clearly see that there are only a couple of windows uh, where the opacity goes down close to zero or completely to zero. In fact, if we have uh, 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 photons that have uh, very short wavelengths uh, in the gamma and X-rays uh, here on the uh, left-hand side, they get blocked by uh, uh, our atmosphere. And that's fortunate uh, for us for the development of human uh, uh, life uh, on the uh, planet, but that's not good for astronomers if we want to study the very high energy universe. So we need to launch space telescopes uh, such as uh, the Fermi or the Chandra uh, space uh, telescopes operating at uh, 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 gamma or X-ray uh, wavelengths. Then if we move a little bit uh, toward the middle of this uh, view graph, we have the, the visible and near infrared uh, windows illustrated here with this colored rainbow. That's the range of light that the human eye is uh, uh, sensitive to. So clearly it goes mostly uh, unimpeded through the atmosphere. And so we can have facilities on the ground such as here in this figure, the uh, Anglo-Australian Telescope, which is the largest telescope that we have uh, in uh, Australia. 
As we move toward the longer wavelengths in the uh, near infrared, infrared, we have a little bit of complicated uh, transmission patterns. Then the uh, atmosphere starts absorbing again all the electromagnetic radiation. So we need again space telescopes such as the Herschel Space Telescope shown here in this plot. Then as we go to radio waves, we have a real clear window into uh, the uh, universe from uh, the ground. So we can have radio telescopes such as the Parkes uh, uh, radio telescope uh, here in Australia that can carry out uh, 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 state-of-the-art uh, astronomical observations. Then if we continue further, we go toward the longer uh, uh, radio wavelengths. We have the ionosphere blocking again our view of our distant uh, universe. So, We've seen only limited windows. That's our first problem if we want to do observations uh, from the ground. Then a second problem is that if we take, for example, the visible wavelengths where most of the light gets through, still the atmosphere has a negative impact. It is blurring uh, the vision of our most powerful telescopes on the ground. And why is that? That is because uh, the light uh, that comes from an astrophysical source, we can imagine here this uh, 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 dot on the top is, our, uh, is a planet uh, in our solar system, Jupiter. Light from Jupiter has to go through the atmosphere. If we have a perfectly laminar flow, the wave fronts would travel through the atmosphere without being significantly deformed we could get a high resolution image of uh, uh, an astronomical object on the ground. However, in practice, uh, uh, the atmosphere always has some amount of uh, turbulence. The turbulence introduces a time variable refraction index which deforms the wave front of light and therefore gives us a blurred image of our astronomical uh, object. And that's the fact that is leading to the twinkling of the stars. And uh, if you're looking at a star lower on the horizon, it has to go through more of the atmosphere, and there is more twinkling than a star straight up to the zenith. Then we have uh, finally a third effect that is uh, uh, um, uh, hampering uh, observational efforts uh, from the ground, and this is particularly uh, 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 relevant for uh, near-infrared uh, observations, uh, which we'll see are related to the Skyhopper idea. And that's the uh, point that if we have uh, um, uh, the atmosphere, the atmospheric gases can create background diffuse emission at the wavelength potentially of uh, interest for our uh, observations. And our atmosphere contains water, other, uh, other molecules such as uh, hydroxide, OH minus, which can be rotovibrationally excited and then they emit uh, at near uh, infrared uh, wavelength as a result of that. That's a particularly annoying uh, background because it is time variable. And to illustrate this, this is an old uh, image uh, uh, but quite uh, uh, um, interesting. I'm going to play a movie uh, uh, of this camera uh, from the two micron all sky uh, survey showing observation at 1.6 uh, 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 microns. The camera is pointed straight up at the zenith and the movie covers one hour and 45 minutes. So as we go see, the stars over this one hour and 45 minutes, stars and galaxies are moving throughout the field of view because of the uh, uh, rotation of Earth. Uh, and the points in the back are our astronomical sources, but we see them through this fog in the foreground, which is uh, the glow, the diffuse glow of Earth's uh, uh, atmosphere. So these are not clouds. The night was perfectly uh, uh, clear sky. That's just uh, uh, OH and uh, water, which is creating this uh, uh, diffuse background at 1.6 micron, which, let me remind you, is uh, uh, further in the infrared than the human eye uh, can see. We go only to out to about uh, 0 0.8 uh, microns. So if we take all these three effects 
together, uh, we can see why there is advantage in uh, going uh, out to space uh, to observe uh, uh, astronomical objects. And to reinforce this point, uh, in this uh, view graph, uh, I put together uh, uh, a combination of uh, uh, ground versus uh, space-based observations taken at visible wavelengths. So that's one of our best bands uh, for uh, doing uh, astronomy from the ground. And indeed, uh, astronomers have very powerful telescopes on the ground, such as the Subaru uh, telescope on Mauna Kea in uh, uh, Hawaii. It's an eight meter mirror telescope, one of our most advanced uh, uh, ground-based uh, uh, observatories. In principle, uh, should have a collecting uh, uh, power and a capability to deliver both higher uh, resolution and deeper imaging with more details compared to a telescope such as the Hubble Space Telescope on the right, which after all is only a modest uh, mirror to uh, and uh, uh, 2.4 uh, meters in uh, diameter. Yet, uh, if we look at the image, uh, this a small patch of the sky uh, uh, in the north uh, uh, that uh, uh, Subaru and Hubble have both looked at, we see immediately that the Hubble view of the uh, uh, night sky is much sharper compared to its larger counterpart uh, on the ground. And this is particularly apparent if we take this uh, green box uh, in the top panels uh, and we zoom into this box that's done in the bottom row. And that's really clear here that uh, uh, there is significant blurring and missing important details, for example, on the morphology of this uh, uh, spiral uh, uh, galaxy and all the clumpiness uh, associated to it uh, that uh, becomes apparent only when we have uh, a facility such as the Hubble uh, Space Telescope. So this is the brief uh, motivation for uh, having uh, a wide array of uh, space uh, uh, telescopes uh, that provide a strong synergy across the electromagnetic uh, spectrum going from the gamma and the x-rays in the ultraviolet. We have seen that uh, uh, at the visible near infrared wavelengths where we do have uh, ground uh, telescopes, uh, still we have really competitive science uh, from space all the way out even to the radio uh, uh, waves uh, with uh, a Russian radio uh, space telescope uh, uh, currently in uh, orbit. So let's now take a moment to go through some of the highlights of space uh, astronomy. There is clearly with such uh, an abundance of uh, facilities, uh, space uh, telescopes have contributed dramatically to our uh, understanding of how the universe formed and evolved. But uh, I've selected a few highlights from the Hubble Space Telescope, mostly because Hubble observes at wavelengths comparable to the human eye. And so we can appreciate immediately the beauty of some of the sites that uh, Hubble has taken over its 27 year uh, uh, mission. So let's start from close to Earth in our own solar system. This is a picture of uh, uh, Jupiter taken by Hubble in 1994, just after comet Schumacher-Levy impacted on Jupiter's uh, surface. This is not only an interesting picture to document the impact, but uh, uh, the detailed study has uh, allowed advancing our understanding of how the atmosphere of uh, uh, Jupiter responded to the impact, uh, what is its composition, and uh, 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 its uh, uh, properties. It also raised cosmic impact awareness, seeing a big comet uh, 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 crashing uh, into a planet such as Jupiter has spurred interest in uh, impacts on Earth and monitoring uh, of uh, asteroids to uh, uh, map potential threats. If we now take a little bit uh, uh, further step, we move further away from us, but we stay in our own galaxy. 
uh, here we have one of the uh, highest resolution uh, mosaics ever taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. That's the Orion Nebula, which has been uh, uh, observed repetitively constructing a mosaic that is more than uh, 50,000 by uh, uh, <coughs> 50, 50 million by 50 million uh, pixels. So it's a, it's a 2.5 billion pixel uh, image. Uh, we can s zoom in to tiny dots in, this, uh, uh, in the main picture and capture with incredible uh, details uh, how stars are forming within the uh, Orion Nebula. And in particular, one of the highlights of the science that we have uh, obtained from images like this one is the demonstration that protoplanetary disks are common in star forming nebulae. And this has reinforced the idea that uh, situations like we find in a, uh, with our sun uh, surrounded by multiple planets are not the exceptions but are rather common in the universe. This in turn prompted uh, uh, large investments into trying to detect uh, and characterize extrasolar uh, uh, planets, which is one of the focus of modern uh, astronomy. Now, if we take one further step away from us, and we look uh, uh, at the distant uh, uh, galaxies, the Hubble uh, uh, telescope has been able to spot exploding stars in far away uh, galaxies. We can mm -hmm. see here three images on the top of galaxies before a uh, supernova explosion, and on the bottom, Hubble has captured the light here from exploding uh, stars in uh, galaxies 10 billion light years from us. Uh, and this has led to the 2011 uh, Nobel Prize for Physics because the studies of these uh, supernovae have demonstrated that, that the, this cosmic uh, acceleration, our universe is expanding faster and faster as time passes rather than slowing down. And this is associated to the presence of uh, uh, dark energy. Finally, if we take Hubble and we push it to the, its detection limit, we stare for hours in the same patch uh, of the sky. Uh, we detect thousands of galaxies in a region that is a uh, hundred times smaller than the full moon size. That's the field of view of the Hubble Space Telescope, tiny compared to the full moon, yet shows the richness uh, of the universe in terms of number of uh, uh, galaxies. This picture uh, is not the deepest, but it's particularly interesting to me because it's one of the pictures uh, that I've taken uh, with uh, uh, observations I was uh, awarded time for. And here we can see these five uh, uh, circles which indicate the positions of tiny red dots in the image that are galaxies at more than 13 billion light years from us. And they are just at the detection limits. If we zoom in, we can see their light. Uh, here on the uh, right. So, with this brief uh, overview, uh, I moved from near us to the edge of the observable universe, shown some of the uh, um, uh, discoveries that Hubble has done. So, where are we at the moment? Well, there are two current uh, frontier problems that are particularly relevant for space telescopes, and those are where are we coming from? how we can use space telescope to characterize the first generations of stars and galaxies uh, in the universe, uh, and how those uh, early objects influenced then the uh, galaxies and the stars uh, like our own Milky Way and like our sun that formed later in the history of the universe. The second uh, key uh, uh, frontier problem that astronomers are working on is that are we alone big uh, uh, questions? Or if we want to phrase it in another way, the search for uh, Earth-like planets uh, around nearby stars uh, in our solar neighborhood and in our uh, 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 galaxy. So uh, uh, to 
proceed and make progress on these uh, uh, topics, we have some key uh, challenges. As we saw from the Hubble image on uh, some of those distant galaxies at uh, uh, 13 billion light years from us, we're looking at needles in a haystack. And to reinforce uh, this uh, uh, point, I have here a fly through one of the deepest images ever taken with the Hubble telescope, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And we see in this image, same size, much smaller than the full moon, uh, uh, size for scale, we see thousands of galaxies. We are moving progressively away from Earth. We have used the information on the colors of these galaxies to uh, map their distance to us. And then we are zooming in into a tiny little red dot, which is a galaxy at 13 billion light years uh, uh, from us. So because of the expansion of the universe, the most distant galaxies are uh, uh, red. And so we need infrared observations to characterize them. But infrared observations are difficult from the ground, and we have a needle in a haystack problem. So how can we solve it? Well, we can uh, take advantage of the synergy with the other space telescopes. And instead of discovering galaxies uh, that are very far away from us, we can use the idea of uh, looking for explosions of uh, stars uh, that emit a very powerful gamma ray radiation. And because stars live in galaxies, if we detect the gamma ray radiation, we can then follow up uh, in these positions. And when a gamma ray burst explodes, also creates briefly a flash of uh, uh, radiation at uh, optical and near infrared wavelengths. So we can do a prompt follow up in the in infrared to capture the light from the afterglows of GRBs and then uh, identify where some of the most distant galaxies in the universe uh, are. In terms of exoplanets, uh, uh, the key challenge here is a little bit different. We know where the closest stars are, but we need really very high precision measurements to observe uh, uh, and detect uh, extrasolar planets. One of the methods used, which I will focus on tonight, is the idea of a transiting uh, exoplanet. So if an uh, uh, exoplanet is passing between uh, their uh, star and us, it will create a short uh, uh, blip in the brightness of the star. Part of the light from the star will be absorbed by the planet. So if we look at the uh, uh, brightness of the star as a function of time, as the planet passes, goes down, and then will go up again. Clearly, this is greatly exaggerated effect in the view graph. The closer the planet, the, more, the deeper uh, uh, the blip uh, uh, will be. The further away the planet uh, from its star, the, uh, the smaller uh, the effect. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, the, uh, the most common stars near uh, us are uh, much smaller mass than the sun, so they are emitting infrared light. And that's challenging from the ground. We have seen the time variable background makes this type of studies very uh, difficult. So uh, the uh, idea and the solution to try to find planets that are potentially habitable, and that means being further away from their stars, that their signal uh, of the transit cannot be detected easily from the ground, can be the following. We could spot, try to spot exoplanet systems that have one planet uh, close to their uh, host star. That can be done from the ground. But here, uh, water cannot uh, be at the, in the liquid state. It's too hot, too close to their star. Then we follow them up with space observations. And if we are fortunate and if uh, uh, exosolar uh, systems are common, then we can discover, uh, hopefully, planets uh, that are further away from their star where uh, water can exist in the liquid state. And this was done earlier this year. Uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope invested 500 hours uh, to follow up one of these uh, conditions, uh, a red dwarf uh, star with a closing transit. And Spitzer discovered several planets in the so-called habitable uh, zone. So the method is proven, but requires uh, space resources. And time on space telescope is very scarce. So the question that we can ask is, can we build a space telescope uh, 
with an affordable budget to contribute to these uh, uh, research themes. And the answer, thanks to technological uh, advancements in the miniaturization technology, is yes, if the telescope is uh, small. And I have, well, how small? Well, I have here the uh, uh, size comparison between what I'm going to propose and uh, describe to you, the Sky Open Space Telescope, this dot here, and the Hubble Space Telescope, which has the size of a bus. And since the comparison can be hard to see on the, on the view graph, I have here a very uh, zeroth order representation of the Skyhopper uh, CubeSat. It's essentially a shoebox, uh, 30 by 20 by 20 centimeter uh, cubes. So what are this class of uh, satellites or uh, CubeSats? They are essentially the smallest conceivable uh, 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 satellites at the moment, nanosatellites or CubeSats, and uh, we measure their sizes typically considering a basic unit of a cube of 10 centimeter on the edge. And they are la launched in standard fully enclosed containers, so very set, very well-defined standard. All cube sets of one unit have the same uh, dimensions. Then we have seen here Skyhopper. This is a 12-unit uh, 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 box. So this essentially contains 10 one-unit uh, boxes. And the various form factors that are available can go up from one unit, two units, three units, six units, 12 units are the most common uh, uh, form factors. Uh, these type of nanosatellites were introduced toward the end of the uh, last century in the United States as educational platforms, and they are still going very strong uh, in their use of educational platforms, including here at the University of uh, Melbourne. And we can see here uh, some uh, students from the Melbourne Space uh, Program working on a uh, CubeSat. The interesting aspects of CubeSats is that uh, the standardization of their form makes it easy uh, to each hike a ride uh, to space. They can be fitted into standard uh, deployer uh, pods, and then they are small sizes. Uh, if uh, there is a space mission launching a big satellite weighing tons and tons, there is often a little bit of spare mass that can be taken to orbit. So the canisters for CubeSats can be located at the bottom of the payload of a rocket. Uh, the CubeSat has been inserted uh, into the canister, and then the CubeSat can be deployed uh, to space. For about 10 years, this idea of having a small satellite was mostly focused on uh, uh, education, students learning uh, how to build a, a satellite, maybe communicate with it, not doing uh, really serious uh, uh, science uh, with CubeSats. However, in the last 10 years, the situation has really changed uh, uh, thanks to evo rapidly evolving uh, uh, technology. Uh, and uh, starting from about 2008, CubeSats are playing a bigger and bigger role in uh, research, uh, with a larger number of uh, uh, launches uh, uh, today focused on science missions rather than education. They have here one example, uh, the Colorado, space, Colorado Students Space Weather uh, Experiment. It's a three-unit uh, uh, CubeSat, so three 10-centimeter uh, uh, cubes in a volume. It is depicted here. And this uh, uh, student-led CubeSat is one of the most uh, successful ever in terms of number of uh, peer-reviewed publications uh, that uh, have uh, uh, stemmed from its data. It led to 17 uh, peer-reviewed uh, publications uh, uh, so far, illustrating really the potential of uh, uh, CubeSats for uh, uh, research. Uh, along with the uh, uh, growing interest of in uh, uh, research with uh, uh, CubeSats, we see another trend emerging if we look in this view graph at the number of CubeSats that have cumulatively been launched 
as a uh, 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 function of uh, time in uh, years here. Uh, we see first that by the end of 2015, there were over 400 CubeSat launches. I checked the number as of uh, uh, today, and we are at 699 uh, uh, launches. So uh, another uh, 300 launches have been added in the 20 months or so since this view graph uh, was produced. And we have here the various colors represent different types of CubeSats. Yellow is university CubeSats. They were clearly the leaders early on, but uh, look at the, this wedge uh, in violet at the base. Uh, these are commercial CubeSats. So there is a real interest which is uh, driving the development uh, of uh, uh, CubeSats with uh, 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 growing uh, uh, potential uh, re uh, economic returns uh, from uh, launching CubeSats, which is really uh, interesting uh, the commercial uh, sector, in addition to growing interest by research uh, uh, agencies. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, almost 700 CubeSat launches. So, where are we in Australia with respect uh, to the uh, CubeSats? Baby steps uh, are being taken, but it's very positive uh, recent progress. In May, the first uh, three uh, Australian CubeSats were uh, uh, launched from the space station. They each hiked a ride uh, th thanks to the QB50 I initiative. It's an international collaboration to study the, uh, the thermosphere and carry out a technological uh, demonstration. And two of the uh, three uh, CubeSats are fully operational and are delivering uh, their uh, science and technology demonstration uh, objectives objectives uh, as we are speaking uh, now. Uh, in, uh, at the University of Melbourne, we also have uh, an active program uh, working toward development of uh, CubeSats. I had mentioned earlier when uh, I'm talking about education, the Melbourne Space uh, Program. That's a student-led uh, and uh, driven organization with all, over 100 volunteers uh, uh, working uh, to design, uh, build, test, and then uh, launch a one-unit uh, CubeSat called uh, CS1. So if you're interested, you can uh, visit their uh, website and be uh, up to date with the great development work that the, our own students are doing at the moment. And let's now that we have seen a little introduction on the CubeSats, uh, go back to astronomy and ask the question, can we use CubeSats for astronomy? At the moment, there are among the 700 CubeSats uh, launched, there are no astronomy CubeSats uh, yet uh, in uh, space. And why is that? Essentially, we have three challenges for using CubeSats for astronomy. The first challenge is that if we want to do astronomical observations, we need to have an extremely precise and accurate control of where our CubeSat is uh, uh, pointing. Astronomical observations require us to stare for long periods of time at the same patch of the sky, yet the CubeSats, uh, if they are in low Earth orbit, they are moving at 10 kilometers per second as a typical uh, uh, velocity. So try imagine having a long exposure picture taken with your camera uh, of a background uh, uh, point while you're moving uh, on, the, on a car. That's really challenging because you have to keep repointing the camera to the object uh, you want to uh, observe as your moving uh, uh, vehicle uh, travels uh, uh, across uh, Earth. So the second challenge is the data rate. Uh, if we take astronomical observations, we have megapixel uh, images, and we need to transmit them uh, down uh, to the ground. Uh, 
Uh, CubeSats uh, typically can pass over ground stations on, only for uh, brief uh, uh, periods of time in which communication is feasible. So we need rates of uh, thousands uh, of uh, 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 kilobits per uh, second. But the typical radios that are used uh, in a CubeSats uh, only give us a factor 100 in data rate lower than what uh, would be suited for uh, astronomy. Then the third challenge is that uh, astronomical detectors to have very low noise levels require to be in very stable thermal environments. And if you're interested in, uh, at, uh, uh, in uh, at observations in the near infrared, we also need to cool them enormously. A typical near infrared camera on a telescope needs to be cooled to uh, below 150 degrees. Uh, Kelvin, that's uh, about 120 uh, degrees uh, uh, below the freezing point of uh, water. Yet, at the same time, in a tiny CubeSat, uh, we need to have our camera cooled incredibly and in a freezing environment, uh, but then we have the onboard electronics, the computers. Those don't work well at, the, uh, at, at such temperatures. They like to stay Ab around uh, zero degrees uh, uh, Celsius. So we need really uh, uh, accurate uh, design for the thermal uh, uh, systems on board a tiny uh, CubeSat. Fortunately, in the last few years, have seen a dramatic technological progress that now gives us accurate uh, miniaturized reaction wheels uh, as well as a st star trackers. Uh, star trackers are essentially wide angle, large field of view cameras that can observe uh, uh, hundreds of stars and measure in uh, real time the position uh, of the uh, CubeSat and where it is pointing, uh, feed the information to the computer and to the reaction wheel and keep the CubeSat stable. We have S-band radio antennas. S-band is essentially microwave uh, communication, same wavelengths as uh, uh, your Wi-Fi communications uh, at home, uh, that can deliver us higher data rate. We have satellite phone modem that has been successfully tested on uh, CubeSats. And we have miniaturized cryo coolers uh, that are uh, uh, being developed for CubeSats, so we so can also solve the thermal management uh, issue. So putting everything together, we can develop then the Skyhopper uh, concept. And thanks to this technological advancement, our tiny telescope uh, in space can outperform an array of two meter size telescopes on the ground when observing at infrared wavelengths. Why is that? For two reasons. We have no atmosphere and we can access all the sky in 90 minutes because Skyhopper uh, uh, at 600 kilometers orbit uh, will do a complete revolution around Earth uh, around uh, every one hour and a half. So what can we do with uh, uh, such a facility? Well, first, we can follow up the uh, 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 exoplanets uh, that we know from uh, ground or other facilities have a nearby transit, not habitable world. And uh, with Skyhopper, we can uh, uh, detect uh, if uh, a further away potentially habitable Earth-sized uh, exoplanet uh, is uh, uh, transiting around cool stars uh, in our solar uh, neighborhood. This is an observation which is possible only from uh, space, from the ground. The background, atmospheric background that makes this impossible. And we expect to be able to detect uh, a half a dozen of Earth-like uh, uh, planets plus many other larger planets, super-Earths, which are an easier observation to uh, carry out. Then we'll spend 80% or so of the time uh, searching for exoplanets, but uh, uh, we can easily interrupt such observations, and if we uh, have a gamma ray burst uh, uh, exploding somewhere uh, in the sky, uh, we can promptly feed that information to Skyhopper thanks to uh, uh, immediate communication. Skyhopper can point at it and characterize its uh, uh, infrared uh, after uh, glow. And that's what uh, gives the name to our satellite. 
uh, Skyhopper will be able to repoint within a, a couple of minutes of the trigger. That's a hopping uh, from one position on, uh, to the other in the sky, which is 1,000 times faster than the Hubble Space Telescope. Therefore, we called it uh, 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 Skyhopper, and we have uh, the Spinifex hopping mouse uh, in our uh, uh, logo. Uh, we expect, uh, for, with these time-critical observations, uh, to be able to detect uh, a dozen uh, gamma-ray bursts exploding in the first billion years uh, after uh, the Big Bang, approximately doubling uh, the number of currently known uh, events at this uh, uh, distance uh, from us. So, how we're going to do that? We have here a preliminary design for uh, our spacecraft uh, will host uh, in about half of the box, six of the units, for the telescope and the cooled infrared camera. Then four uh, units will be used for the avionics. And at the moment, we are carrying a contingency, two units of empty uh, space. Uh, Skyhopper will be launched uh, in uh, this size, but then it will deploy once in orbit, uh, open up the solar panels, uh, and open up uh, also some thermal radiators to dissipate the heat. Let's take a quick look at the uh, telescope and camera design. Uh, if uh, you are interested in seeing uh, our current uh, uh, optical design, it's really ultra compact. That's 20 centi uh, uh, centimeter uh, from one end uh, of the measuring bar uh, to the other. And we have a 10 by 20 centimeter square rectangular telescope to maximize the collecting uh, power uh, uh, with a four mirror design. And here we can see in blue the bouncing uh, of the uh, light uh, collected from the primary mirror and then going into our camera. And the key innovation for our camera is that we'll do uh, simultaneous imaging in four near-infrared uh, colors, going just red of what the human eye can see, 0.8 microns, all the way to 1.7 uh, uh, microns. And we'll have a four megapixel detector uh, 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 on board our spacecraft. Our approach to this is to focus uh, the uh, development uh, of uh, uh, components uh, to the science payload, the telescope, the camera, where our expertise lies within the universities, as well as on the thermal management subsystem, how do we cool the camera, while we plan to buy everything else commercial of the shelf technology already proven to work uh, in space uh, by other CubeSat uh, uh, launches. Also, because we have seen here in Australia the CubeSat and space expertise is just starting, we have a strong collaboration, not just with other uh, Australian institutions, but also with a number of international partners that we selected for their specific expertise in either leading CubeSat uh, projects or astronomical instrumentation from uh, space. Where are we at with the project? Uh, at the moment, we are conducting preliminary uh, designs, uh, gratefully acknowledging support at the University of Melbourne from the Stone and Spencer Trusts and from the Leiby Family uh, Foundation. Our collaborators in Germany also have secured the funding to build an engineering prototype of this innovative four-color simultaneous uh, near-infrared uh, uh, camera, and that should be uh, uh, built by the end of the year. We have a proposal under review by the Australian Research Council to fund the, the next phases, the final design, the fabrication and testing, the assembly, the integration, and again testing because once we launch Skyhopper, we have no way of fixing it, so we need to be extra sure that everything works, and that's one key uh, with space mission. You need to uh, carefully design, build, and test every little uh, step of the process, and then we uh, hope to have two to four years uh, observations uh, starting after 2021.
our vision to conclude is not only to carry out outstanding science uh, from the first prototype uh, in the fields of exoplanet uh, detection and characterization and study of the first generation of stars and galaxies that form the universe, uh, but also to move forward then with a more ambitious plan of having a skyhopper constellation. We can uh, learn from the first prototype and then replicate it for a fraction of the cost that will give us the advantage of having uh, multiple uh, observatories available to observe either different patches of the sky at the same time or having continuous viewing because we don't risk the Earth being in the way of uh, our astronomical observation for one of the satellites, for a b even if only for a brief period of time. Then, more generally, we are aiming at increasing uh, Australia's uh, space capabilities and by bringing a small satellite into space also inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. So, to conclude this, uh, 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 sorry, uh, sorry, uh, and if you're uh, uh, interested in getting more info, being updated on how we progress uh, or uh, get, uh, opportunities to get involved, please visit our website, uh, very easy to remember, skyopera.space, or follow us on uh, Twitter. So, to conclude, uh, let me uh, show you uh, our journey to launch uh, Skyhopper with uh, a preliminary uh, video showing the orbital deployment uh, sequence. So, we start from a launch, uh, a rocket like the Falcon 9 from uh, uh, SpaceX, which is going up in space, separating uh, uh, the uh, lower uh, uh, parts, and now opening up the payload uh, section, deploying the main uh, satellites that are paying for most of the launch. Then the bottom section has this pod launcher for the CubeSat. It is launching our Skyhopper uh, spacecraft, and after a successful deployment from the rocket, Skyhopper will start opening up its solar panel, followed by the thermal uh, radiators, and now we have uh, uh, our space telescope uh, ready for uh, doing uh, science uh, observations. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Michaela. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, you're happy to take a few questions? Uh, absolutely. Would anybody like to ask a question? Uh, yes, just back here. When, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So, what do we do with the reaction wheel? For brevity, I didn't mention the magnet torque that, so that are key for the attitude control uh, uh, system on the telescopes. So we have here some magnet torques as part of the uh, ADCS module. The idea is essentially you dump angular momentum b uh, to the uh, uh, magnetic field of uh, Earth. And so, uh, so then you can respin up uh, using power your uh, 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 reaction wheels. Yeah. Twenty. Yeah. Uh, does it have any protection or, or ability to dodge space junk? There'll be more off. Yeah, space junk. That's a that's a really good. Thing. The question is, uh, what do we do about space junk? Well, first, the sp the, there is a very small probability of a collision. Space junk is a problem, but typically satellites have a very, very low probability of colliding with each other. However, as there are more and more satellites being launched in space, that's a real concern. And one of the requirements, for example, to obtain a license, uh, a launch certificate to be able to launch a satellite such as Skyhopper in space is to demonstrate that it will not create a space junk 
problem. So, for example, you need to demonstrate that you can be deorbiting safely and being completely burned up in the Earth's atmosphere within a given number of years. So we could operate Skyhopper for uh, four or five years, but we have to demonstrate that surely by uh, uh, 15, 20 years, uh, Skyhopper will have completely burned up, or will not be a long-term junk uh, problem. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Lovely speech. Uh, my question, like that, a short to but maybe everybody understand. Professor, how much, how much time, knowledge, science and technology, economy, and different brain, and multi-quantum communication help us where we come from? Because this is where we come from, philosophy question, and philosophy challenged by that. How much time? knowledge, science and technology, economy and different brains, and multi-quantum communication help us where we come from. Where we can yeah, so, so where we come from uh, is one of the most fundamental questions uh, that I think every human being is asking. And that can be asked from a variety of angles. And uh, every one of us can contribute uh, in a different way. As astronomers, uh, we can contribute by studying how the first generations of stars and galaxies are formed, how they then influence uh, the, the next generations. You have to keep in mind that uh, when the uh, universe uh, was uh, 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 in its uh, initial phases uh, at the time of the Big Bang, uh, well, the chemical composition was very different from, uh, from today. There was only hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. The heavier chemical elements, the hydro, uh, sorry, the oxygen, the carbon that are necessary for for life uh, have been produced uh, inside the stars, uh, dispersed into the cosmos by supernova explosions. So uh, we are stardust in a sense. So if we want to understand where we're coming from, we need to understand how the first generation of stars and galaxies uh, came into being. Thank you. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a very good question, and the question is what, uh, what will James Webb uh, uh, observe when it's first operational? James Webb is, an, is a near-infrared uh, 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 and far-infrared telescopes will observe from about 0.8 uh, 1 micron to 28 microns. We'll have a larger mirror compared to Hubble, 6.5 meters. It will be fantastic for both of the science uh, themes uh, that I've uh, introduced uh, uh, today. And in fact, one of the plans that we have uh, is to use a Skyhopper as a target finder for the James Webb Space Telescope. So we can build Skyhopper with a sort of a university budget, uh, which is a thousand times smaller than uh, uh, the budget for the James Webb Space Telescope, yet they have a similar lifetime. So if we can devote the sky hopper observations uh, to identify extrasolar planets uh, that uh, potentially have liquid water, then the James Webb could take spectroscopic observations uh, to uh, detect uh, uh, the compounds in the exoplanet atmospheres. If we find gamma ray bursts uh, uh, that are at the edge of the observable universe, explosions that happened 500 million years after the Big Bang, uh, uh, we have star forming regions so distant identified, then we can point at the James Webb Space Telescope and study them in more uh, uh, detail. Oh, oh, okay, I see. So, so your question, what is the, well, the, I think this, I, I, what is the firman? So, so as a, 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 a science can answer questions about what is, uh, what are the properties of the universe, what are the laws of physics, what happened after the Big Bang? 
why the Big Bang uh, uh, happened, uh, why we are, the, the laws of physics are in the form that we can uh, study and observe with the scientific methods. Uh, it's not a question that we can uh, answer uh, with uh, astronomy or with uh, science. That's a question for philosophy or uh, religion. Then no. What is the Van Allen belt? No. 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 Belt. Belt. Van Allen belt. I think that you're referring to the magnetic field that, that protects uh, Earth, uh, uh, that, uh, that is created by the rotating uh, 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 iron uh, core, and that uh, very conveniently protects us from the solar uh, wind. So, so the, the, there are two parts of, uh, of the question. The first part is, uh, what are the commercial drivers for CubeSats? Uh, they are various and growing, but there are two main areas. The first one is Earth imaging. So, commercial CubeSats share some of the same uh, technology for uh, that, uh, that are relevant for astronomical observations, but they are interested in looking down to Earth rather than looking up. And uh, uh, Earth imaging is uh, taking uh, a growing uh, uh, commercial interest because you can monitor crop growth uh, with uh, satellite uh, uh, images. Uh, you can uh, uh, monitor the health uh, of uh, uh, fisheries uh, by studying, uh, uh, for example, temperature of uh, uh, the water. You can uh, have, of course, uh, huge national security uh, applications uh, like monitoring ships' movements. And the traditional approach was to have a few very expensive uh, big satellites. But with the improvements in miniaturization technology, you can just, uh, you can have a constellation of uh, 50 hundreds of small satellites. Uh, and that can, in principle, give you huge boosts uh, in cost saving uh, and also give you access uh, to a new, new domain of Earth imaging, the time domain. So instead of taking, uh, having images of Earth taken with a big satellite, uh, uh, one, uh, one time, and then that's it, you can buy those images. Uh, if you have CubeSats uh, and you're interested in seeing time variations, uh, you could buy uh, uh, the right to have your field monitored every day, every week uh, for, uh, for changes. Second uh, commercial aspect is communications. And there, uh, there have been uh, ideas on how to use uh, CubeSats, uh, for example, to st uh, for a high uh, 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 speed uh, uh, internet uh, uh, transfers uh, to challenging regions such as the poles. Um, then the second part of uh, your uh, uh, question, the, the, so, sorry, your second question was uh, uh, advertising. Yeah, advertising, I don't think it will, <laughs> it will work because a CubeSat is, uh, is tiny, 600 uh, uh, kilometers from us. Uh, uh, the power requirements for a projector, uh, yeah, I, I don't think they, uh, they would work, uh, fortunately for us. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very, very fair and very good question. As I was mentioning, it's a, it's a university type uh, uh, budget. So uh, uh, we think that we can, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, design, launch, uh, design, build, launch, and operate Skyhopper for less than 10 million uh, uh, Australian dollars. Uh, and that there is a significant cost in the manpower for the design uh, of the first uh, copy. Like building, uh, uh, building the second one uh, would be a fraction uh, uh, of the cost. And the launch, uh, 
is significant but not the driving uh, uh, item in the budget. Uh, launching this box uh, to space is going to cost you about 1 million US uh, dollar to a low Earth orbit of 600 kilometers. Around the planet, uh, yeah, well, there are, uh, as I was mentioning, there are, uh, there are about uh, uh, 700 CubeSats that have been launched uh, to date. There are a number of other nanosatellites which have similar size, but unlike CubeSats, they are not standardized, so they are not called CubeSats. Uh, some of them uh, re-entry re fairly quickly in the atmosphere. If you launch them at 300 kilometers, which is like the typical International Space Station orbit where many CubeSats are being launched, uh, a tiny CubeSat has much more drag uh, relative to its uh, uh, kinetic uh, energy than the space station, so it will decay very rapidly. A few months uh, gets burned out. So my guess is that there might be a couple of hundred objects uh, of a comparable size. Yeah. This, well, that's, a, that's a fa uh, like we, we are not as powerful as, a, as a Hubble. We have a cost that is 1,000 times uh, less. Uh, so uh, the, the, and that's why we sort of focused on the two key themes, uh, 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 like ha very high precision measurements uh, of the brightness uh, of nearby stars uh, that are even too bright for Hubble to observe them. Uh, they, they would blind uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but that's what we need, uh, uh, patience uh, and uh, collecting a lot of data uh, with a very stable, uh, low noise uh, environment. Uh, and if you look at the discoveries of extrasolar planets, uh, they have been driven uh, uh, around uh, 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 more luminous uh, uh, stars than the ones we want to observe from the ground uh, with small telescopes, uh, 20 centimeter size telescopes. Uh, and there you find, uh, from the ground, you tend to find hot Jupiter, so uh, bigger planets and much closer in to their star, but you can, uh, you can find them. And then gamma ray bursts are the universe's uh, really most powerful explosions for a brief moment of time, very much like we've seen some supernova uh, images. Uh, a single exploding star can be thousands to millions of times brighter than, a f than its host galaxy. So that for a brief moment in time, and for gamma ray bursts, we're talking minutes, uh, the uh, explosion is uh, 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 millions of times uh, 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 brighter than, uh, than a galaxy containing uh, billions of stars.